Today's message from Rev. Debbie McDonald was recorded November 27, 2016, and the episode is titled, You Can't Get Here From There, subtitled, I'm on the Road to My Highest Good. And today we've included the spirit, talent, and voice of our special guest and musical artist, Ray Davis, who can be found on Facebook and also on his website when you visit joyouspodcast.com and look at the show notes. Come visit us at seasidecenter.org or join us in Encinitas, California sometime where we always have great music, a spirited message, a joyful, loving community that awaits you. Feel the joy. Seaside. Thank you. I heard one little peep over here. I'm like, <laughs> good morning. <laughs> well, it's my honor as it is every Sunday to introduce our guest artist. And uh, I know I'm not just speaking for myself. We love when he's here. Uh, came down to be with us this morning from Agape, from LA. And um, every time I see him, he, ceases, he never ceases to amaze me. He brought a guitar, which I didn't even know he played till this morning. So he plays piano. Uh, trumpet and guitar. He's an amazing singer, songwriter, and just a spiritual being with amazing energy. And I hope that you are moved by his music as much as I am. If you are, please see him after the service. He does have CDs as well. So please help me without further ado to please welcome Ray Davis. Good morning. This is a song that is for all the practitioners. And we got, and we got any practitioners in the house? Let me hear you say, yeah. No, no, we're not going to do that. We're not doing, it's not that kind of a show. Not that kind of. Now, this is for all the practitioners in the house and for those of you who uh, perform the, the, the practitioner thing when you go out into the world. And you know you're doing it when, when instead of taking people at their face value, you decide... Okay, that's what you're doing, but I know who you really are. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. All right, I hereby dub the practitioner. And this song's for you. It's called Compassion. One afternoon She cried and cried so much That soon she was Tepid and forgotten The fear said This time I think he's gone for good So in my mind I'm wondering Should I say this or that or not Then suddenly the silence rang Everything was quiet I knew what was needed Just love and compassion Second ring, he mumbled before confessing he was totally beside the fear moan. He's only toying with my heart. So now I'm wondering how to start to unstop a mind. Everything was quiet 
quiet I knew what was needed Just love them Compassion Fear Binding, blinding fear Fear no longer speaks to me Oh no, 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 no It's a love, love right now, right here That clearly colors all I see Today, tomorrow someone's rightful pay will not be in their possession. Sometimes I feel like such a simple-minded fool. Maybe I should go back to school to pursue some safe profession. But in the silence, right here. Passion, yes. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, so good. We were enrolling him in ministerial school back in the, in the green room, yeah. <laughs> oh, so good to be here with you this morning. You know, I've been mulling over this whole process that's been happening to me, this change and this move and taking on the new position, and, and it's has got me to be a little bit reflective, thinking back about the whole path and my spiritual journey and how did I end up here, you know? Uh, and realizing, you know, that sometimes those things in life happen that they just feel like magical and they unfold perfectly at ease and grace. And then other times things seem really difficult and hard and painful, you know? And I've had a variety of both of those. Uh, my talk title is You Can't Get Here From There. And, and I chose that because it's what my spiritual mentor used to say to me a lot. Uh, it was a woman that uh, I just loved and admired, and she taught me so, 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 so much. And she used to, talking about her own life, she used to say, you can't get here from there. She would talk about the life that she came from and the life that she was living today as being this amazing, magnificent life. You know, and, and the truth is that we know that we can get here from there. You know, this, this experience with Monterey has just unfolded. It's been one of those times of, of just pure joy, of easy and grace, of just that unfoldment, you know? And, but it all began for me with the decision. As soon as I made the decision fully that it was time and it was okay to leave, 
It was okay to move from San Diego. It was okay to leave the home that I've lived in, the city I've lived in for 25 years. Things just unfolded. That's just the way it works. We make that decision and then things start to unfold. The first thing was that I decided I would go ahead and candidate for an open pulpit. That's what we call them when we have churches that are looking for a minister. It's an open pulpit and we have our website that we can go and we can look and we can see. And there was actually another church that called to me. There was a very small church up in the Washington area and I thought, that's where I'll go. And Dr. Christian said, oh, just apply for Monterey too. You might as well. You're filling out the whole package. So so I did. So I went ahead and sent them both in, and it just unfolded perfectly. There was two of us that were up for the position. I went up there, and I spoke, and we do a workshop, and got to spend time with the board. They offered me the job, and I was, it just felt like, well, okay, here I go. Put my house on the market. I t- literally had three couples that came through and looked at it. I had two offers, and a 30-day escrow. And it's closed, you know, and, and here I go, you know, it's spirit. Those are the times when spirit just shows up in a big way and you know it's unfolding perfectly and it's beautiful and wonderful. Not all times are like that, you know, but, but this one has been for me. You know, my spiritual journey, uh, as I started thinking about it and realizing where I had been and where I was going, I, I had to think back, you know, to the beginning. And what I know for me that as a very small child, I was called to something. I didn't quite know what it was. And and I've had the privilege of teaching uh, six years of the practitioner training the first year. A lot of people that have come through PRAC training have had the same experience of knowing very early on that they were called to a life of service, that they were called to a life of of spirit. You know, and I remember I was raised Catholic and I went to 12 years of parochial school. And in the second grade, what does that make you, seven or eight maybe in the second grade, the nuns came into the classroom and they had all the boys left and it was just the girls and they told us to pay attention to listen to if we had the calling. Now in second grade, my response was la 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 la, no, 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 no calling. I didn't want to be a nun. I knew that and I wanted, you know, what little girls want. I wanted to have a family and, and get married and have children and do all those things. You know, but later on as I moved through life, in the seventh grade, you do what's called your confirmation in the Catholic religion. And they do it a little bit later now, but it's the first time that you really get to choose for yourself. You really get to choose if you want to do this God thing or not, you know? So I remember uh, they talked to us about being a soldier for Christ, and we could volunteer and sign up to be a soldier for Christ. And I thought that sounded pretty good. I'd sign up, you know? And I really did take it seriously, though. I really did think about it and contemplate it and said, you know what? That is something I do want to say yes to. And so I did, you know, I did. I took it very seriously, the ceremony, and I I said, yes, I do. I do dedicate my life to source. I dedicate my life to spirit. I dedicate my life to God, which is the word that I knew then uh, that I called it. And uh, you know what happened? Shortly after that, the wheels fell off the bus. You know, interesting how life has a way of doing that, you know. Here I was stepping in, and uh, things fell apart. My parents' marriage started having trouble. I was 12 years old, and then they divorced when I was 18. So we had six years of sort of dysfunctional family, if you will. <laughs> and uh, and uh, at 14, I discovered drugs and alcohol became my pastime, became my path to God. If I could just get loaded enough, I surely would find God. I don't know if any of you can relate to that. But, uh, you know, it was the time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and that was my motto. I mean, that was my thing. I was going for it. I was living in the 70s. I thought my calling was really the 60s. I had missed that. I was too young, you know, but here I was in the 70s. You know, and what happened for me was that was the beginning of this spiritual path for me, of a deepening of the spiritual path. I was up in Los Angeles. I was pursuing an acting career. I was waiting on tables, as most actors in LA are doing, and I was had a waitress job, and I was taking acting classes. I was taking acting classes at the Beverly Hills Playhouse, and my instructor was Cal. And Cal was an amazing man. He still is an amazing man. And he must have seen something in me, something of the struggle. He himself was very vocal about his recovery from alcohol and drug abuse, and he was very open about it. And I was working on a part where I was playing a woman who just got out of a recovery home. So he suggested that I should go to a 12-step meeting and do research. Well, I did. Lo and behold, what I found there was me. You know, I found me, I I heard people talking about what I was feeling on my insides. Um, 
And I found a solution. You know, I found what it was that I was seeking. I found what it was that I was seeking, you know. And, and as I've been contemplating this spiritual path, a friend of mine always says, is it odd or is it God? You know, and I've been looking at those instances of, this is really odd. Or, or it's God, one or the other. I'm not sure, you know, and, and the truth is that it's God. So in 2014, I went on a cruise. I was on a cruise ship. And, uh, you know, if you've ever been on a cruise ship, everybody has dinner, and there's the, the show afterwards that you go to, and, like, the whole first seating goes to the show. So you kind of want to get there so you can get a seat. Well, I was with my friend, and we both decided we were going to go to the restroom, and both of us assumed the other person was going in to get the seat, and neither one of us did. So by the time we found each other, the theater was full. The theater was full. We looked around. We saw two seats way up in the front. So we made our way down there, and we got into the seats. The lights came up, and I looked next to me, two seats over, and I thought, I know that person. Yeah, I think I know that person. And the whole show, I was sure I knew this person. And sure enough, as, this, as the show ended, I stood up and I said, Cal? And it turned around, and it was certainly him. And we were able to, all those years later, to connect. And to, uh, I was able to tell him how important he had been in my life and how much he meant to me. And uh, he was happy to see that I was still alive, you know, and I was still doing well, and I had become a minister. And it was one of those instances, you know, of honor God. How weird is that, that the only two seats in the theater were right next to this man that had really saved my life? You know, and I was able to let him know just how important he was to me. You know, and, and, and part of that is that January of this year, I'll be 29 years clean and sober. You know, thank you, thank you. And I don't share that with you because it was anything spectacular that I did, but it was that which put me on my spiritual path in a much deeper way. It created that within me that went back to seeking, to really finding what is this thing? What is this thing that's calling me? What is this... What is this inside me? What is it that I'm wanting to express? You know, and it gave me that foundation. And uh, early on, somebody, a friend of mine, sent me a copy of The Daily Word. I don't know if you've seen The Daily Word. It's the Unity magazine that's like our Science of Mind magazine, where it's a daily a thing for every day. And I really related to it. I related to it because it was Bible-based, and it had these quotes from the Bible that I knew from growing up, but they had them in a metaphysical way. They were written with a metaphysical interpretation, and they explained them in a way that, like, that made sense to me. Prior to that, what I had been attracted to was Native American spirituality, and I couldn't even say the word God. It was great spirit worked for me, and I loved how the Native Americans had such reverence for the earth and for the planet and for all living things. And this sort of was a nice introduction to new thought through the daily word. And uh, then I got the Science of Mind magazine later on and found in the back of the magazine they used to list all of our churches. I don't think they do anymore, but I saw that we had a church right here in Encinitas and I was like amazed. I didn't even know it existed. It was when you all were on 2nd Street. And I went down there with my then husband and my two little children. And Linda Light was the youth director. And uh, my kids went there. And I went into service. And I fell in love. I fell in love. Dr. Christian was just uh, married to Callie. They were newly married. They were talking about adopting a little a, a, a child. And so all there was all this great family energy. And I was looking for that. I was looking for a place to be with my family. And so I continued to study. I continued, actually bought my Science of Mind textbook at Barnes and Nobles. Now, I don't know how many people do that, you know, to go to Barnes and Nobles and get science. And I bought Troward, Edinburgh Lectures. Now, here's my light reading, right, that I got to study. And I had no idea what it said. I absolutely, when I opened that science of my textbook, I had no idea what Ernest Holmes was talking about at all. You know, have you had that experience? But when you all moved here to this building in 2001, I made a commitment to be part of this spiritual community. I was part of the first foundations class here at Seaside with Reverend Catherine Bonin was in my class. And, uh, and, and we started here. We started here at that very first foundations class and I haven't left since, you know. As Dr. Christian said, I've been through many different places and things here at Seaside. I served on the board, and I've been youth ministry and practitioner, of course, and then ministry. And, and it has been an amazing, amazing journey. Two weeks ago on Wednesday, not this last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before, the talk title was The Power of Community. 
And I shared with you all how powerful it is to be part of a spiritual community, to be part of really any tribe that calls to you. You know, find that place, find those people that speak to you and hook up with them, join them. You know, what I was taught was to find those people that had what I wanted or to find that group that was doing what I wanted to do and hang out with them because I would rise to the vibration of you all. And that's what I wanted, and that's what I did. So I had you here at Seaside. You became my spiritual family, and I've spent lots of times in lots of classes learning and growing and, and, and going along this spiritual path. One of the uh, things that came to mind for me this week, too, was that uh, the part of Shakespeare from, I think it's from As You Like It, All the World's a Stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their entrances and their exits, and one man in his time plays many parts. And then Shakespeare goes on to talk about six or seven stages of life. But the truth is that we do have so many of these hats that we wear, so many of these phases that we go through. You know, I've been a mother, I've been a daughter, I've been a wife, I've been a sister, I've been a friend, I've been a minister, I've been a practitioner, I've been a PTA president, a Girl Scout leader. You know, I've been all these things in this wonderful journey of life You know, that's brought me exactly to where I am right now. And I know that that is the way that it unfolds. These last couple of weeks, I've been reading, reading, reading stories of healing because I really wanted to come here and share with you some great stories of healing. And I've read a lot, and there's a lot of amazing stories. When you start looking for those stories on the internet, in books, wherever, there is a lot of stories of people that have amazing spiritual experiences, that have had amazing healings. You know, and here's... Yesterday, I'm sitting at a meeting, and a woman sitting next to me, Mrs. Robertson was her name. I had never met her before. She didn't know me from Adam. She didn't know I was a minister. She didn't know anything about me. Out of the blue, she starts telling me the story of her childhood, and she lived where there was four different denominations on each corner, and she lived in one of the houses, and the house across the street was a rabbi minister. And one stormy day, she was looking out the window as a child, and the rabbi and his family got into their car, and... An uh, electric pole fell on the car, start, sparked the car, started a fire. As she was watching, the pole lifted. The members of the family got out. The pole landed back on the car and burnt the car to the ground. Now again, honor God, right? Why is this woman, I don't even know, telling me this story? It's amazing. It's amazing. One of the things that I did come across was the story of Myrtle and Charles Fillmore. I don't know if you know their story, the story of the founders of Unity, of the Unity Movement, which is one of our New Thought churches. So New Thought Umbrella, and we have Unity, and we have Religious Science and Divine Science, and, and they're sort of underneath this whole thing that we call New Thought. So Unity is sort of one of our sister churches, if you will. And Myrtle and Charles Fillmore, they really began Silent Unity and the whole Unity Movement through healing. Healing was really the emphasis. And Myrtle had what was then called tuberculosis, whether it really was tuberculosis or not, we don't know, because so many things were called that then. But she went and listened to a new thought speaker. And the thought that caught fire within her was that she was not her story, that she was not what people had told her her whole life. She was told that she was weak and that she was sickly and that it was a family thing and it was just her destiny to be sick and, and, and weak. Well, she heard this speaker and she embraced the idea that she could change that, she could heal that, just because that had been told of her, it was not the truth of who she was. And she came to embrace the truth of who she was was source. The truth of who she was was spirit. She went ahead and talked to every organ in her body and told them that they were actually divine and they no longer had permission to be sick. And she healed herself. Isn't that amazing? It, it's amazing. And her husband, Charles, seeing this, and people started coming to the house, and they were, she was praying for them, and they were getting he healing. Well, Charles, at 10 years old, had had an injury. I think it was an ice skating injury where he broke his hip, and his leg grew deformed. It ended up being four or five inches shorter than the other leg, and he had a lot of pain. Well, he continued to do this work that his wife was doing. He continued to study and read and to learn. And he, over the course of a few years, lengthened his leg, stopped using a crutch, and stopped wearing the platform in his shoe. 
Now, how does that happen, right? These are amazing stories of healing. You know, our own Ernest Holmes, the founder of Religious Silence, Dr. Uh, Marilyn Leo, she tells a story in one of her books of being a young child and being at a party at, at Ernest Holmes. She lived next door. She was raised next to Ernest Holmes. And Ernest was a great gardener. He loved gardening. He was showing people his rose bushes. And he ended up cutting a deep gash in his arm from one of the thorns on the rose bushes. Well, what he did is he went ahead and he prayed. He wrapped his arm in a dish towel and uh, went about the rest of the party. A few hours later, he removed the towel and there was absolutely no scar whatsoever. Right? So we know that these spiritual principles work. You know, and then we wonder now, why aren't we hearing about them all the time now? Why aren't we hearing about these great healing stories that were in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the early start of our movement? But the truth is that the stories are still happening now. You know, Dr. Christian tries to have people come up and do testimonials of things that have happened in their life, the healings that have taken place, the people that have had stage four cancer supposedly and have no cancer whatsoever. I mean, this is already, this is still happening. We have the stories of people like John of God that are doing miraculous things. You know, the stories are still happening. They are out there. The healing is taking place. The uh, Fillmore's, did a thing when they started Silent Unities. They did a thing where they wrote a covenant, a dedication. So what they did is they wrote a statement saying that they were dedicating their life to this work that they believed in, and in turn, they knew that Spirit would source them and give them all that they need to be successful. And they signed it, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. You know, and when I was in ministerial school, we were asked to do the same sort of covenant. I was in early, maybe my first or second year, and we were on retreat, and we were asked to write a covenant. We were asked to write a covenant dedicating ourselves to source and what we expected from source in return. And I did mine, and it's framed, and it's beautiful, and I love it, and it sits on my altar, and I would have read it to you today, except that it's packed in a box. So, uh, it, 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 but what happened once again when I fully stepped in and dedicated myself, the wheels fell off. The wheels fell off the bus once again. You know? And my thing was like, really, God? Really? This is what's going to happen now? You know, and the truth is, is that it was waiting to happen. It had been boiling up. Before I went to ministerial school, I knew, I knew in my heart of hearts that my marriage would not survive ministerial school. I interviewed every female minister I knew, I talked to them about their marriage. I talked to them about their divorce. I asked them what had happened. You know, and truthfully, the statistics weren't great. They really weren't. But there were some that had stayed married and some that had happy marriages. And, and what happened for me is that I entered a dark night of the soul. It was not good. It was not pretty. It was painful. It was one of those times where everything just fell apart. Everything that I thought that I knew, I wasn't sure that I knew anymore. Everything that I thought that I believed, I wasn't sure that I believed anymore. And what I had to do was I had to work at my prayer life. I had to work at my spiritual practice. I had to kind of pull myself back to this place that was new and different. I had to be willing to let go of the marriage. I was married 23 years, and, and it was painful. And it was painful. But what has happened today is that I'm in a place of such freedom and such newness and such uh, joy that I would never have been able to do had I stayed where I was. It was time to go. It was time to leave. It was time to change. You know, and, and as I went back into ministerial school, the healing began, and uh, I joke that I was the longest student in ministerial school, but I don't think I really am. But it was a long journey, believe me, because I took that time off in between. And, uh, you know, when we make a decision to dedicate ourselves, when we say, I'm willing to die for this thing, or I'm willing to stand up for this thing, it doesn't always turn out to be unicorns and rainbows. You know, and that's what I wanted. Man. I wanted, I was being good, and I was doing good, and man, it should look good. Well, it doesn't always. It doesn't always. And that was what I had to learn. It wasn't about being good or getting good enough to get whatever it is that I thought that I would get, was getting. It was about living this spiritual journey. It was about being on this path. It was about living in this world, but not of this world. I love this uh, from the Science of Mind textbook. All nature conspires to produce and manifest the freedom of the individual that it may unloose its own energy. We may be sure God is for us. So true. God is for us.
So what I came to realize as I was reflecting is that what I have chosen to do is to live a spirit-driven life. You know, we have the book, The Purpose Driven Life. And, and what I really believe for me is that I've chosen to live a spirit-driven life, that everything that I do, every choice that I make is based on, is not in alignment with what it is that I believe in and my values and my beliefs? Am I believing that God is everything? Because that's a big one for me. You know, there can't be God and anything else. Either God is everything or God is nothing, right? And I go with God is everything. So as we operate in this idea that God is all there is, then anything that happens has to be of God. You know, I can't say, oh, that divorce wasn't it. It was all part of the spiritual practice. It was all part of the spiritual evolution, the spiritual principles that unfolded here. You know, one of the big things that I think is really important is that idea of living a spiritual life versus knowing a spiritual life. Because we can know it, right? I mean, we can read all the books, we can go to all the classes, we can learn all the affirmations, we can say all the right words, but are we really doing it in our heart of hearts? Are we taking time for our own spiritual practice? And I, I have room to grow in that area. You know, are we taking time for our spiritual practice? Are we putting God first? Are we making the choices that are in alignment with our values and beliefs? You know, are we freaking out? Are we moving into fear, as Ray was talking about? Are we giving fear a home? You know, the principles work either way. And a couple little things that I just loved, and I'm going to just share them briefly with you before we close. I had two little tools that I loved. One was the golden key from Emmett Fox, and you can Google it and look at it, and it's a really little easy practice that Emmett Fox created, and it's really simply turning away from the problem and turning to God. That's really all it is. But he has a little more instructions in there. It's a little small pamphlet. But whenever we're worried, we turn to God. Whenever we're thinking of the problem, we turn to God. And it's powerful and it works. There's another one that I really loved, and it was a little booklet I think put out through Unity, was the activity of God. And the prayer goes like this, the activity of God is the only power at work in my life today. All false beliefs, all negative ideas are dissolved right now by the loving, forgiving action of God. I am perfect, whole, and complete. I would say that like hundreds of times, over and over. I mean, those days when you just, you know, your mind's cuckoo and it's telling you other stuff. It's just like a mantra, you know, you can just say it over and over again, and it can keep you, and it moves you forward. It moves you from that place that you think you might be stuck into a new place, and it happens magically and easily, and sometimes painfully, but it happens, but it happens. I'm going to close with this as a quote from our Science of Mind textbook. Nature will not let us stay in one place too long. She will let us stay just long enough to gather the experience necessary to the unfolding and advancement of the soul. This is a wise provision, for should we stay too long, we would become too set, too rigid, too inflexible. Nature demands we change in order that we may advance. Good words, huh, Ernest Holmes? You know, I just want to close with saying how important you all have been to me on this spiritual path, how blessed I have been to spend the last 15 years with you. Truly, you have changed me into a new person. I'm so changed because of all of you and each of you, and I love you, and I'm so grateful for you, and I know that we shall meet again as we walk this path together. God bless you. God bless you. Love you. Love you. Mm. Love you. Mm. Thank you. Mm.